today, um, COVID-19 has reinforced many realities that guide um, Global Health Corps' work since, since its inception in 2009. This includes the realization that public health is global health and global health is local. Viruses don't respect borders. We know that an outbreak anywhere is an outbreak everywhere and that a national solution won't solve a global health crisis. We need global collaboration to drive global solutions. And we're currently seeing how investments in global health benefit not only low-income countries, but all countries. And leadership at all level matters. And that's where I feel really proud of the work of Global Health Corps. In addition to technical or clinical leadership, we need an all hands on deck approach from supply chain experts to data analysts to strategic communicators. And during this crisis, we've seen pretty clearly that being nimble matters, being flexible matters, adapting and solving problems on your feet are critical. And so with this context in mind, I am thrilled you're here for a conversation on how we can use this pandemic to transform how we lead, that we can use this global health crisis to shift our perspective and rebuild a more equitable, healthier world. Before I dive in, I'd love to introduce Heather Anderson, who I know you, most of you know, she's the CEO of Global Health Corps, and I'd invite her to say a few words. Heather? Thank you, Julie, for moderating this conversation. And thanks to everyone for being here today. I really appreciate it. I am really excited for all of you to hear from our wonderful alumni who are working to advance health equity in Rwanda, Zambia, and the US. Uh, during my eight and a half years at Global Health Corps, I have had the pleasure to spend time with all of them at various retreats across our regions. And I also wanna thank them for joining us. As we come together, it is uh, hard to believe that it's been nearly a year since the WHO declared a global pandemic and no doubt that we will all be taking stock for years to come for what was gained, what was lost, and I think importantly, what was learned. And you know, as Julie said, we are at a critical juncture to make decisions about what kind of world we want to live in and what it's going to take for us to get there. I am heartened to hear more conversations about health equity and examining what that really looks like. I'm heartened to hear conversations around diversity and leadership and who needs to be at the table making decisions and also conversations around why collaboration isn't just nice to have, but is a necessity. Because that is what, as many of you know, at Global Health Corps, we've been focusing on for the past decade. We've been working to challenge many of the traditional leadership norms, combating stereotypes about what leaders look like and who has the, the valuable expertise that we need when we're making decisions in global health. And so I'm thrilled that you'll get to see all of this for yourself today as a Global Health Corps CEO. I, of course, have to brag about our community members a bit because uh, GHCers not only embody our values of resiliency, empathy, humility, but they are some of the most dynamic people I have ever met. And I think it's safe to say that this past year, that has been a very valuable leadership trade. It's been an honor to uh, you know, do what we can to be catalyzing this community of leaders and through their networks and support their learning and growth and impact, um, not only for the folks that you're gonna hear from today, but through our thousand plus community. And uh, you know, again, excited for you to hear more from them. So I will wrap up my comments now and turn it back to you, Julie. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. So I am honored to introduce our three panelists who are leading during a challenging time and seizing opportunities to improve their communities. Um, we have Jessica Mayenda, who was a 2016-2017 fellow in Zambia. She's currently a program manager at Viamo, which is a USAID funded project. We have Christian Benimana, who was a fellow in 2011 to 2012 in Rwanda. And he's currently the principal and managing director at Mass Design Group and director of the African Design Center. And Angelica Racierlo, who was a fellow 2016 to 2017 in the United States. And she's currently on the editorial team at Doximity, um, 
hoping that Angelica is going to join soon. Um, we're expecting her and you'll hear from her later. Um, but I want to jump in with Jessica. Let's start with you. You have been managing large scale development projects um, aimed at improving the health of local communities in Zambia since you finished your GHC fellowship four years ago. Tell us what you've learned in these roles that you'll take with you beyond this pandemic. Um, thanks, Julie. I just want to add to say um, COVID-19 is just another layer on top of the existing health challenges that we've been working to address um, uh, basically all my career, which is uh, part of hunger, malnutrition, malaria, and sexual reproductive health. And more than anything, it showed us just how fragile our health systems are and how as leaders, we need to shift from short-term focus on immediate solutions to more long-term focus on uh, strengthening health systems. Without that system focus, I believe as leaders, we'll lead ourselves astray and we'll be caught in the same cycle again the next time a crisis hits. When the pandemic hit, I was working for the civil society scaling up nutrition and just more around strategic planning, policy analysis uh, around food systems. The leadership style that I chose during that time was trying to understand my clients and policymakers and trying to estimate their needs, uh, which were immense, looking at how when, when the pandemic hit, it uh, resulted in the food crisis all over Zambia. People could not move food from where, uh, where it was grown to where people needed it. And there was widespread hunger already uh, with the other issues that we're facing as a country in terms of uh, low rainfall caused by climate change. And just trying to go, as an advocacy organization, CSO Sun, we needed to go into the community and gather stories and use these stories to bring them back to our leaders and use them as a way of advocacy for policy change. There was a lot of innovation and learning, which are qualities I think I've been working to develop since my GHC fellowship. And leaders were not encouraged uh, to be learners, but embracing constant learning is I believe is very critical for leaders who want to imagine and build and new health systems. And when I joined Viamo in October of 2020, I believe, I started managing a huge USAID project, which had different thematic areas, such as nutrition, agriculture, livelihoods, and wash. I was already thinking I'm overwhelmed and diving into too much that I'd never really done before. But I believe um, GHC prepared me for the role that I'm currently in. When I joined uh, GHC, I, I was placed at Planned Parenthood Association of Zambia. And the first month in my fellowship, my organization lost 70% of its funding due to the global gag rule. Uh, PPAZ being a pro-abortion organization was hit really hard and almost uh, all their staff had left. So I was already doing more than I bargained for and I had to really think on my toes. But I feel uh, I grew as a leader um, in a really short time. I'm extremely lucky to have had that training and that preparedness so that I can, it can help me carry out my current role. I actually found myself recently going through the 20 cards of leadership that they were given at our training and our training materials on how to deal with uh, upward management, managing your boss and all those things, which is, which is a great um, opportunity that I had at training and now I'm able to use it so many years after my 2017 uh, year as a fellow. And also working for Viamo, uh, which is a big organization and growing so fast has been really grateful. Uh, has been, I've been very grateful for that because Viamo had already solutions and systems in place uh, to work remotely and was also uh, enabling others to work um, remotely, uh, reaching audiences that they couldn't reach through mobile phones. So Viamo is a digital technology company that helps um, uh, people reach uh, their beneficiaries through mobile phones, through uh, mid, uh, social behavioral change and data collection. So working for Viamo has been amazing and certainly learning opportunity, learning to coordinate these systems, learning about the systems and just think, uh, thinking outside of the box like Viamo has, has made me ready for um, the changes uh, on how to carry out work and how we interact with each other. And I feel this flexibility will be very key for the future. Thanks, Jessica. Christian, this question's for you. Rwanda has been recognized for its successful pandemic response. What do you attribute this to? Well, um, 
I don't know if I'll be able to find all the right answers, um, but I have I have ideas about what has led to that. Um, I think there are two main things that have contributed to the success um, of Uganda achieving those results. I think the first one um, was that the leadership recognizes the threat um, that such a pandemic possess on an already fragile community uh, from so many levels. And they made a quick and very early decisions about how they're seriously going to mobilize systems run in the country to respond to it. So COVID-19 was not only left in the hands of healthcare professionals, but it was also made a mandate of social organs, security organs, um, economic um, uh, ministries in charge of like economics and finances, like basically they pull everybody in to be, to take it seriously and respond to it in like unity. And I think that was the major contributor to, to that um, uh, relatively good management of COVID-19. I think the second thing that probably has contributed to it is because um, Rwanda following like the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi, um, the general population also has developed some form of respect and understanding for the leadership. So when these decisions are made, um, the cooperation of the general population is critical for that solutions to work. So I can't say that the cooperation was 100%. Obviously, there are some people who, you know, for some reason feel like it's, you know, it's too bothersome to them to abide by simple rules like wearing a mask and you know, not going to where you're not supposed to go unnecessarily. But I feel like generally the, the general population understood that the pandemic, the response to the pandemic does not depend simply because the authorities have said so, but it's also because um, the information provided to them proved to them that it's dangerous and they need to respond to it and take measures, these measures seriously. So those are two things I feel like have made it possible for the country to manage the pandemic much better than many other countries that either the leadership did not take it seriously or the general population did not cooperate even though the leadership has taken it seriously. Yeah, thanks. I have a follow-up question. Um, as an architect by training, your work is more closely linked to physical spaces. So I'm curious, given the pandemic, social distancing, most of us being told to work remotely, how has that shifted your work? Um, and what do you see as the role of architecture and design in pandemic recovery? Okay, so okay. if I understood you correctly, two questions in one, it's like how it has shifted or impacted our, uh, our work. And also, uh, sorry, the last question was about. How, how you see architecture and design, if you see it playing a role in yeah, if pandemic I see, recovery if I see efforts. And, yes, sure. that makes sense. So, uh, how it impacted our work. Surprisingly, I would say positively, um, and for the following reasons. Um, uh, from like, you know, the beginning of mass, we've operated under this hunch or assumption that we had that architecture do actually has a role to play in, um, in the space that deals with our health, both physical and mental. Um, and that architecture and design can be effective tools to contribute positively to improve um, those outcomes. That's the reason why I'm a Global Health Core Fellow as an architect to begin with, uh, which is something that has been very difficult to explain to many people before. Uh, we've had conversations about GHC. So, because of that, we've worked really hard to find evidence that we can present to people both uh, negative and positives that prove this idea that 
the spaces we occupy have a direct and indirect impact uh, onto not only our personal health, but our community health, uh, you know, as, as much as you want to expand those definitions. And I can say that we have successfully made some strides towards making a compelling case um, about this link between the spaces we occupy and the investment we put into them and the outcomes targeted with uh, both like the personal, physical, mental health, you know, for ourselves, but also like community health um, and all those things associated with like social justice. And when the pandemic hit, we felt like for some reason, these things that we've been talking to people for the last 10 years became very apparent to almost everyone instantly. You know, because then we started talking about these you know, health challenges posed by COVID-19 in terms of spaces, talking about you know, six feet, which is a dimension of the way people need to be separated from one another. All of a sudden, we're confined within our own homes and, and we started noticing how um, unequipped they are to um, deal with this new situation. All of a sudden, children are taking lessons from their homes. All of a sudden, you know, more so in developing nations, we realize how even the concept of working from home is so challenging because people simply don't have a home that they can work from. We start realizing how uh, these spaces that we have so, for so many has come to attribute to a lifestyle of going to restaurants and bars and nightclubs, the spaces we have created to uh, account for that lifestyle is not resilient to this pandemic. So then all of a sudden we start questioning all these things about ventilation and, and you know, travel in airplanes and all these sort of things. And, and all of these things I think like are further proof that we have a bigger role to play in contributing to the physical space that will not only aim to improve health outcomes of individuals and communities, but also building the resiliency against um, these pandemics. Because every epidemiologist that uh, at least we've finally paid attention to in the last year has been saying the same thing, you know, pandemics are here, we need to do something uh, about our lifestyle and occupation of the planet to do it responsibly so we do not make the problem that is already bad much worse. And if we continue on this trend, they're going to be more frequent, more serious. Therefore, we need to do something serious about it. So we, we really believe that architecture and, and design will be or will also play like a a pivotal role into how that new plan is going to be either effective or ineffective. Thanks, Christian. That's really interesting. Um, I don't know many architects in global health, so it's fascinating. Angelica, welcome. Glad to see you. Um, you're a writer and a nurse, which is also an interesting combination. Um, how, how are these different skill sets um, important to you and how have you used them in advancing health equity? Sure, thank you, Julie. Um, and good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, being a nurse and a writer has definitely informed my work during this pandemic. If anything, writing and nursing, I feel like is more in the spotlight than ever during COVID. Um, you know, I, I know for a fact that there's been more enrollment and interest in the nursing career and a lot of frontline workers have the spotlight right now and writing and storytelling um, is more important than ever to, for processing um, a lot of the grief and suffering that frontline workers are going through right now and my studies in narrative medicine 
um, have actually prepared me and I've done a lot of work with leading workshops in narrative medicine, which is like medical humanities um, in helping clinicians process um, very complex feelings of burnout, moral injury um, through writing, through art and the arts and, and um, different texts. And my work right now um, is at Doximity, which is kind of like LinkedIn for clinicians. It's the largest online medical professional network in the US. And it's been re pretty rewarding uh, to be producing content as an editor on their editorial team for a platform that's really needed right now um, for clinicians on the front lines. And as a writer and editor at Doximity, I've been able to bear witness and like hold space for, for these stories of healing and grief, as well as synthesize and make medical research more accessible than ever in a time when we know like COVID research changes by the hour, um, guidelines are changing state by state, country by country. And um, my work at Doximity has been able to make that more accessible to the people who need it most. That's really great. Thank you. Um, I'm curious, post pandemic, um, it sounds like this is a community that's not going to go away, that thrives and is getting something out of these connections and sharing their story and helping each other, right? Um, how, how do you see that evolving? Or, um, you know, I think it's, a, it's an opportunity to discover new tips and tactics and, and, and new leadership skills and mechanisms. Yeah, definitely. I think institutions, hospitals, universities, anywhere where you will find clinicians in training or clinicians who have you know, a year, two years and more out of this pandemic, these, you know, grief and, and the, the, the high stress that clinicians are facing is not gonna go away. If anything, it's gonna compound over time. And I think it's very important that we make room and space to process together in community, especially in times of isolation, um, when we can't be physically in the same space together. Um, we will have to find more innovative ways to, to, to build community um, in a time when it can be you know, very isolating and, and, and dangerous to, to gather. And how do we do that? How do we you know, make sure that clinicians aren't feeling like they're alone in this, that everyone else is sheltering at home, but they have to go out onto the, the front lines. It, it's very much kind of like going to war and, um, and, and feeling like you know, they're out, out in the battlefield uh, per se, that there's a lot been a lot of like war metaphors I've been seeing in like in humanities and narrative medicine work comparing um, like this pandemic time to um, to times of war and unrest. Yeah. All right, I'm going to ask one rapid round of questions to each of our panelists, and then I want to open it up to all of you um, who I'm sure have interesting questions. So. One of the most incredible aspects of Global Health Corps is the power of the network and the collective leadership and support it unleashes. You've each remained connected regionally and globally to your um, alumni fellows and um, especially during this time of the pandemic, I think that's probably been pretty um, incredible and rewarding and supportive. Um, what, what has that been like for you, the, the power of, of the network? I think it's one of GHC's unique um, assets. I'll start with you, Jessica. Hi. Um, if I think for us in Zambia, I think um, in the beginning of the pandemic, we had really low cases. Um, I think I remember so well the beginning of, I think should have been in June, when we had our first announcement of cases, we had four cases. And in a country where there's 17 million people, people were not taking it seriously. And, and we had quite a high number of recovery rates. So life continued as normal. We would listen on the news and read about what's happening in other countries, but we never thought that it was something that was happening here. I know as GHC already as a community um, and being obviously in health, we were very uh, concerned. We had a lot of people who were involved in COVID response in the, with the Ministry of Health and different uh, other uh, spheres. And these were really good in trying to uh, provide the community through a, like a WhatsApp group about accurate data and making sure there was no misinformation, what was being done and preparedness on the ground. So I felt that was uh, a really good uh, resource that we had uh, as a chapter. And then fast forward to where we are now when we have the, the second wave and it's quite deadly and COVID is now someone that you know, it's your mother, it's your aunt, it's your brother. We've uh, 
try to continue as much as we can to carry out some activities, um, even uh, making sure that obviously that we're safe. Uh, remember last year we went to uh, the Black Lives Matter match. It was hosted at the American Embassy. A few of us turned up and stood in solidarity um, with our African American um, alumni and fellows in America. Even if we did not really relate to the racial uh, inequities that they faced, we just stood in solidarity with them because as you know, if inequities uh, persist, uh, we cannot have health equity when, they, uh, when inequities uh, persist. And I think in December when um, we had Christmas and things had slowed down a bit, I think we had a lot of more recoveries. Again, uh, Zambians came out and started behaving normally, uh, even with uh, restrictions from the government. Um, JTC, we continued to uh, reach out to people uh, in our communities, people we, we felt maybe had, been, had COVID, we said trying coming up with solutions in which we had uh, this little thing where we said, if you live alone, you could send a message to an alumni and we could deliver food to your door, get groceries to you. I think it was a really good initiative. In December as well, we came together as a community and we donated uh, food and groceries to our uh, orphanage uh, here in Zambia. We heard we were, someone reached out to the community and spoke about these kids that were living in an old bar somewhere in a shanty compound here in Osaka. We went to that place, donated soap, donated uh, hand sanitizers. We also had Christmas lunch with them. And the alumni community, because obviously it's not like a Zambia issue, most people have lost their jobs. So as an alumni community, we host the LinkedIn training for um, the alumni, just teaching people how to clean up your LinkedIn profile, clean up your CV and try to connect each other. We're always posting jobs for each other. I believe this training, I think a week after we had the training and I cleaned up my LinkedIn profile, I got my current job, which was amazing getting a new job in the pandemic. And immediately I got my job when they wanted references. GHC community were filling up all my reference lists and writing amazing things, which, is, which shows you the power of how this community is in terms of just finding out at a job, finding out, finding out about salary expectations. Everyone was already writing and saying, you need to do this. You need to make sure that they're giving you this. And I feel as a GHC community, I'm currently the chapter leader, I'm the chairperson for the GHC alumni here in Zambia. And I feel leading the chapter is, uh, right now is very difficult because even if we have activities planned out, it's very difficult to know whether we'll carry them out or not, or when we'll carry them out. I believe uh, when the new fellows came in, we had a small meeting with them, just trying to encourage them. I know they joined the fellowship at a difficult time and just trying to hear their perspective and trying to show mentorship. And sometimes when you give someone advice, it's actually the same thing that you are trying to hear yourself, just trying to know that everything's gonna be okay and we just need to focus and do the best that we can. Thanks, Jessica. Christian, over to you. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think for me, Personally, um, the, the network has been supportive in two ways. One of them is to be a source of reliable information uh, regarding the pandemic, but also like everything else that, especially in the beginning where there was a lot of scrambling around, like um, we, <clears throat> we were all trying to, to, to figure out basically like who you can go to to get an accurate information. And because of this already developed type of like trust in um, our colleagues that are working in various, various sectors, it was very easy for us to, to you know, know like, I can pick up the phone and call this person and ask them a bunch of questions because I know they must know something about this. Um, and that helped inform a lot about decision-making um, for us when like in the dispositions and say like, this is what we know and this is what we've been told by people we can trust. And this is why we recommend you that we take these other actions. And then like the other aspect, which is related to the first one is, uh, is also like a type of like brain trust um, that also exists. I wouldn't say like in the whole community, but more like members that maybe are dealing with like similar problems or can contribute to the same problems where you would also say 
you know, maybe talk to people that, again, you trust, have this capacity and sit in this, some of these positions in the organizations that are might, might be similar to what you are dealing with. And just tell them like, this is, this is the thoughts we have, you know, and you know, how does that compare to what you're doing? Do you see any cracks in this plan? Um, you know, what are you guys doing or what are you up to and how is that working? What are the challenges you're meeting? Um, and some of those things like have allowed us to make very, very unconventional decisions actually. Uh, for instance, at Mass, we, we, we made a very early decisions that we, we're not going to close our projects and our offices, but we're going to choose to be the voice of reason to our partners who have invested so much money into the project. And that in these times of uncertainties, like we shouldn't uh, also like give, um, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't participate in the voices that were sounding the alarm, but we should figure out a way of helping and try to explain that even though things are not going properly, we could certainly figure out ways to manage the situations in ways that these projects that have invested massive capital and time to, you know, at, at the time the pandemic started hitting, are not going to fail completely. And that has allowed us to, for instance, say that um, we're going to do everything possible to supply information uh, that is verified to our teams. And the majority of the information came from the GGC community. And that helped, for instance, like some of our international staff, which are many, decide to stay in the country and trusted that you know, they don't have to all fly back because if they did that, then that plan will not have worked for us to be able to continue doing the work to the best capacity that we can. Yeah, thank you, Christian. Angelica, over to you and then we're gonna open it up. Yeah, thank you. Um, just like Christian and Jessica in, in Africa, I've definitely found a sense of community within GHC um, while living here in San Francisco. Um, the first U.S. city to shelter in place and, you know, as we know, California has definitely been an epicenter of the pandemic in America and I'm, I've been really thankful to find connections here on the West Coast and as well as on the East Coast. I used to live in, in New York and Boston and have been involved in alumni chapters for GHC in Northern California and the Northeast as well as working on a, a COVID coalition with other West Coast alumni to address mental health challenges of frontline workers um, with my narrative medicine lens, which has been great. And I've also been able to participate in racial justice and leadership programming through GHC. And it's, it's really renewed my commitment to racial health equity, um, especially in 2020 with, with a resurgence of um, with the Black Lives Matter movement um, coming back to the forefront and have just been feeling re-energized uh, with the work and opportunities that GHC has provided me. And I've also been able to collaborate and reconnect with alumni like um, on an individual basis, like Nancy Chong, who did her fellowship and was Jessica's co-fellow in Zambia. Two of the highlights personally of my year um, in, in, in the pandemic were um, with her mixing her music with my quarantine poetry for radio and traveling to Atlanta, Georgia to help get the vote out in communities of color to flip the US Senate. So it's been really cool, the personal and professional projects I've been able to collaborate on with GHC alumni. Thanks, thanks. It sounds like a really supportive amazing community that goes on and on well beyond your fellowship, which, um, which is pretty, pretty remarkable. All right, I would love for you all to jump in with any questions that you have and we can be informal um, unless you like using that little hand on Zoom, but feel free to jump in and, and ask any of these uh, amazing panelists a question. Hi, Julie, I'll jump in. It's Monica. Um, so this can be piggybacking off of what Jessica and Christian were discussing in terms of this great phrase, the brain trust of GHC. I'd like to know as a board member what your thoughts are to allow us to do that better. 
Um, what tools or techniques do you think we could be employing to make sure that we're aggregating and prioritizing those needs? I assume Jessica will go first. <laughs> I thought you would go, I and mean, I will. <laughs> Um, in terms of what we could do, but I know you're doing already so much off the top of my head. Um, I think the I'm not sure if this is already available, but somebody from either the board or the GHC staff writing recommendations on our behalf or some kind of letter on our behalf when we apply for jobs. I know it's a really difficult time for everybody, but in terms of that kind of support, as well as maybe connections to these uh, different organizations. Uh, I know we had uh, we have a, a great mentorship program and many people do not know how to reuse this resource. Maybe it's uh, on our part as well as chapter leaders and alumni to really advocate within ourselves that this is a, an available resource, but kind of just vouching for people who work with GHC and saying we did the fellowship and we have certain skills that other people obviously have seen would be an amazing um, resource. I mean, I feel, I feel like you're already doing a lot, so it's, it's difficult for me to ask for more, but since you asked, uh, I think I'll, I'll throw some ideas out there. Um, I think the, the, the thing that makes, I think, the brain trust work well, especially for young professionals, obviously, is the trust. Um, but because most of us are more or less at the same level in our careers and experience, the brain part is somehow limited. So. I feel like the, the, if I was to maybe think of like the one thing that I feel like would help would be through either GHC management or through, you know, direct to the individuals, if there was some limited access for when some of these bigger questions that maybe require someone more experienced to chime in and say, you know, I understand you think about this way, this way, that way, but um, you should, you know, consider maybe X, Y, Z, or maybe this is some information that you might not know or have, or this is um, some precedents that I might not based on my extensive experience that you guys maybe are yet to acquire or have that might help you go through that process. I think that type of like um, contribution to helping you know, to helping us like navigate these complex situations that we're in, quite frankly, like in many of us, like still, I believe very young to be dealing with, but still it's, it's not a bad thing. I'm not complaining about it, but I feel like that type of support in allowing the outcomes of those brain trusts to have more um, weight or more uh, experience backing them when they're happening would be something that would be helpful if you can figure out a way that is also not superimposing on your time and, uh, and other things that you're committed to. Great, thank you for those comments. So I have a question for An Angelica and just my finger name, right? <laughs> um, okay, good. Um, I am wondering if you're familiar with the body of work that's been led by Americans for the Arts around um, arts and health in the military um, and sort of how it, it, it struck me when you talked about it's almost like being at war um, and they have done a lot of work around the, the way the arts can address especially mental health issues related to um, military service um, and so um, if you're interested in exploring it, I can connect you with them. I, I um, was very involved in the arts and health and the military initiative um, in a previous role I held. So um, I'm still very well connected with them. So, I, but I think that there's a lot to leverage from that, from those learnings for where we are with COVID and especially, you know, considering people on the front lines. So happy to make that connection if you'd like. Thank you, Ashley. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. I, I haven't heard of the work from that particular organization, but I'm very familiar and I feel like there has been a lot of crossover with using those those military metaphors and 
um, even when we're we're dealing with like trauma, PTSD, um, we know that the the work of narrative and medical narrative is is very powerful. Um, for example, I know at Stanford um, in my in my local area, they have uh, their medical program is very much enriched by narrative medicine, and I know the founder is is very moved by um, military work of the military and how. Um, that can support um, veterans health and and everything. I do see a lot of parallels with COVID and um, feeling like people are in service right now. You know, there there's I'm sure there will be a lot of future studies on, on this work and, and the parallels that are being drawn upon. Um, but yeah, definitely interested in, in connecting um, more together afterwards. So thanks for bringing that up. Hi, I have a question. This is Betsy. I work at Bloomberg Philanthropies and I'm running around. That's why I'm not on camera. But I do have a question for you guys, um, particularly in the on the continent. I'm so curious to hear what it feels like with nobody traveling to visit you and to impose work plans on you and all of that. Um, are you finding that donors and outside agencies are, uh, are offering more autonomy in this moment and kind of combined with the Black Lives Matter movement here in the United States, as well as other broader equity issues and um, in the funding space, um, in addition to the fact that we just can't be physically there to micromanage as much as we normally are, I'm sure, um, coming from a, a, you know, a very well-resourced foundation where we fly around all the time. Um, I'm just interested in like how it feels to not have the presence all the time. I can speak a little bit to that on in work in the US. Um, I was involved in a lot of like work around the elections in the fall. And a lot of that work was done remotely, like phone banking, um, getting together on Zoom. And it, it's definitely looks different activism and and feels different and it's not in person to be together in groups and and uh, and go to places and meet on the streets and things. But I think there's still a lot of like power over Zoom and I think a lot can still be done remotely. Um, like you know getting together on zoom and even being on mute like seeing other people while you're making the calls writing the letters to your legislators so i think you know it's not ideal it's always better to be face to face i think activists are adapting to this digital time and yeah i i, I don't think it's been a hamper necessarily to the work like clearly like you know um Georgia was flipped with like a powerful wave of, of activists from all over the country and all over the world who couldn't physically be in Georgia, but were still able to to make moves. So that was really cool to see. Kristen, I'm I interested. Think... Oh, go ahead, Jessica. No, you can go ahead. <laughs> no, no, no. I want I want you to speak because I know that Betsy's interested yeah. in in the African continent specifically, and I'm I'm intrigued by her question as well. I was just going to say to Christian when he speaks next. You know, Rwanda, it's definitely been a, a darling of the Gates Foundation for many years. And I think it's probably the longest yeah. time nobody from Seattle has come to, to visit you all and drop these demands and micromanage and show up with, you know, expectations. So I'm curious, yeah, Jessica, with how you're experiencing that in Zambia, especially working on a USAID project. I know in the beginning, I think everyone didn't really know how to navigate how everything was done, especially in terms of evaluations. How are you going to check what's going on on the ground? And obviously that helps for them to be here. I think it's twofold in my experience. It's been good not having obviously someone all over your back and checking, oh, how did you do this? Tell me this. But then that's also the disadvantage that someone has, because if I'm on a Zoom call and I'm telling you what I did on the ground and you're not seeing it, you, you, it's just basically me telling you and it's just numbers on the screen to you. You don't see the people on the ground. You don't see the challenges that we have to face while we are in the field. And then also I feel it has also created more paperwork for us because we because you can't be here uh, 
reports are huge. Reports are huge. You want everything to be to pass through you and say, oh, I'm not sure. So now you're micromanaging uh, from a distance and it's more, um, I think people have more time because you're working from home. So you have more time to just say, what is, what is this person doing? What is that person doing? I feel as much as technology obviously is amazing. We definitely, definitely miss people being here and seeing the face of where money is going. Uh, I think we need to come up with more innovative ways of making sure that at least we have a face to the work that we're doing, which is more reporting, more pictures. I've been using quite a lot of LinkedIn and most of our donors are noticing and saying, oh, we saw it on LinkedIn. You guys are working and you're doing this. Uh, so those are the kind of uh, things that we're dealing with. Yeah, I mean, um, it's, it's a very interesting question, actually, because I haven't thought about it. And <clears throat> quite frankly, I, I don't feel like, I don't feel like I have, uh, I can have any feelings I can speak for like the general sense in the country about how we feel about it. And that's a result of a number of things. I think the country has, you know, like the leadership of the country has at least managed to put in place some like very like you know understandable structures that make sure like all the kind of like philanthropic capital that flows into the country follows like a, a good structure so that we who work at you know with um like the recipient of that um funding do not feel the pressures of those demands that are part of like those higher negotiation that happens like at the bigger level um, I think that's one of them. And then the other thing is that for many years, the country has been pushing a lot for the use of technology and innovative solutions and uh, trying to simplify things as much as possible. And when the pandemic hit, there was this kind of like, um, this is the moment to prove that it can be done um generally and, and and therefore like there was this type of sense like um things can still happen with technology like they like one simple example can give like the, the internet coverage in in the city of Tigari must have like skyrocketed like in the like the first six months um of the pandemic because then the government was pushing this notion that people can actually work remotely. Therefore, there is no excuse for people violating these uh, stay home orders and, and, you know, with the excuses that they're going to work. For us at Mass specifically though, because uh, we work with a number of projects that with big foundations that have, you know, given, put in a lot of, a lot of funding. We, I can't say that much has changed from what we've been doing before. And that is probably a result of um, of, of us always working in this space, we were always trying to prove that architecture has a space in um, contributing to some of these programs that the foundations are talking about. So we, we've, we're, we're kind of already built to be creative around how to make those points, regardless whether we're in person or, 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 or you know, like, like disconnected. Uh, one of the specific example I can point to is that we organized this virtual tour of the construction site for one of the, the donors who couldn't make the trip. And our media team came up with this whole immersive experience. I don't even know where they got the equipment from. And we, we scheduled a day on the site where like they were walking through for an entire morning and having these live interactions with the workers and everybody on site and they can converse directly. So like they, even though they can't be here physically, but they can get that connection. And that was like something that someone from our media team just said like, actually this could be possible. And we were the one who proposed it because we were looking for a trip and they got canceled and then we felt bad. And then we were like, oh, let's see if we can do something nice. So we, we, yeah, I don't, I really don't feel that there was a weight that was lifted or that there is like a, a 
think the, the virtual, the, the Zoom thing is not the same, but because of like the frequency of it and, and the constant communications, I don't feel like much has been missed. Of course, like being in person is something that we all look forward to uh, in the future. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really interesting creative solution your team came up with. Um, Jessica, when you were talking, I was thinking about, you know, a lot of the, the visits I would do were to health clinics and facilities. And I was imagining someone just taking me on even a FaceTime call and flipping the camera and, and showing. So, you know, because as a funder, I, I can relate, Betsy, like I'm missing being close to the work and seeing it. It, it, fuel, it fills me up and gives me energy to move forward because I'm removed from the work. Um, so I love, I love hearing these stories and the creativity. We have time for one more question. I'm wondering if anyone has one. And if not, I am happy to pass to Heather, who's going to close this session out and give you all a few more minutes back. But this was really delightful for me. Um, so thank you all. Heather, over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Julie. And thank you, Jessica, Christian, Angelica, um, for joining on our panelists today. And thanks for all of you um, for taking your hour. I know we can all get Zoomed out. So I appreciate you taking the time. Um, you know, I think listening in, uh, you know, and hearing from our alumni, as always, it's really inspiring. And especially since uh, we don't get to see each other in person, which is where I generally get my like jolts of the energy um, by engaging with them is, you know, sort of a few reflections. One is, you know, that, you know, we always say in Global Health Four, like, everyone has a role to play and um, specifically having panelists today for all of you to hear from an architect from a clinician who also works very heavily in writing and narrative and Jessica who's worked across the health sector um, for different health issue areas and yet are all united by the belief in health equity and social justice and are bringing themselves to be serving in their local communities to be you know, continuing to grow in their careers and really embody, as I mentioned at the early part of it, what it is to have to be adaptive. I mean, every single person had to change what their jobs were and, you know, hearing from what they were sharing today of what that looked like was more important than ever. And so it's exciting, um, it's particularly, you know, as we are continuing to, at Global Health Corps to deepen our impact in the alumni program and continuing to help feed the brain trust um, and think about what additional programming opportunities look like and hearing, you know, what is it to have additional mentorship? Like that's all exciting for us and it's where sort of the future is. Um, and I think just reinforces uh, what the ability and opportunity for local leadership looks like. And, uh, you know, as many of you know, as we head into our next year of our fellowships, we are making the decision to have um, an all African national cohort. And that's exciting to us while, you know, it is unfortunate, to, you know, on the one hand, not to have our Americans be joining. I think it also provides space and opportunity for greater opportunities of what local leadership looks like. And, uh, um, and so we're really, we've been thrilled this past year in terms of what that looked like. And our partners have been super thrilled and we're excited heading into this year as well. So uh, I think safe to say, as we think about the future and reimagining what strong and resilient health systems look like, we need to continue to be seeding the field with awesome leaders like our folks here. So, so thank you for joining today. You know, thank you especially for those um, supporters have been uh, really uh, um, engaging with our mission for many years and I appreciate you showing up today. And for those of you that it's been more of the newer relationships, I really continue to invite you in and excited to um, expand the tent in terms of, um, of really what leadership change is gonna look like because it is gonna be a collective effort to change what expectations are, what people think leadership should look like. And I can't wait to continue to have the chance to work more um, with all of you. So thanks again. Thanks Julie for moderating and we'll talk to all of you soon. Please enjoy the rest of your days, afternoons and evenings. Bye everyone. Thank you.